Yeah, it should work. In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of us the opportunity to name our sins to God if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank You for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now, I got an email uh, today, and it has to do with uh, guess who doesn't believe in God. And it's very interesting. It's a bunch of statistics. I don't know how accurate they are, but uh, it starts out like this. Guess who doesn't believe in God? And then it says 10% of Protestants, 21% of Roman Catholics, and 50% or 52% of Jews do not believe in God. And then it goes on to say, that's the surprising word from a new survey by Harris Interactive of 2,306. That's uh, adults that shows belief in God varies quite widely among different segments of the American public. How often do we go to a place of worship? Not much. Most people attend a religious service less than once a month. Still, Americans are far more likely to believe in God and to attend religious services than uh, the people in the other developed countries, particularly in Europe, of course. Europe's a degenerate and we're a client nation. So who believes in God? While 79% of Americans believe there is a God, only 66% are absolutely certain of it. 9% do not believe in God, and 12% aren't sure. And weirdly, not everyone who calls himself or herself a Christian or a Jew actually believes in God. How can you call yourself a Protestant or a Jew and not even believe in God? Uh, Who worships at a religious service? Just over half, that's 55%, attend a religious service a few times a year or more. 36% attend once a month or more often, and just 26% say they attend every week. So, why are the ranks so thin? Well, it's obvious. I mean, when you get to 26%, can't even go to church once a Sunday. I mean, well, it's uh, we're the weird people, I guess, the ones who... Uh, really care and want to come every day. And so we have 26% say they attend every week, 41% of women, and 31% of men attend once a month or more. Protestants are 47%, and they are more likely to go to church once a month or more often than Roman Catholics. And the Roman Catholics go to church 35%, not that they're getting anything out of it anyway. Jews are least likely to go with 16% saying that they go to a synagogue once a month or more. But they're not saved anyway, so what's the point? Church attendance is highest in the Midwest and lowest in the West. That would be California, Oregon, Washington, Hawaii, those places. And that's where church attendance is lowest, highest in the Midwest. That's called flyover country. And now we have belief in God by geography and age. 82% of Midwesterners and Southerners believe in God. So we're in the higher part of it. Compared with 75% in the East and West, that would include the Northeast and the West, where the San Francisco, all of that, we understand that. So our beliefs get stronger as we age. Of those 25 to 29 years old, 71% believe in God. That number jumps to 80% for those over the age of 40 and hits 83% for those 65 and over. And that's natural. They're getting up up in age and they know they're about to die, so they 
I try to come around to some type of belief. But remember, belief in God does not mean salvation. It's belief in Jesus Christ. There are other fascinating facts about who believes in God. 84% of women believe in God. Not Jesus Christ. It's just talking about God. And in, that could be Allah or anything else to some people. 84% of women believe in God compared to 73% of men. Now, here's uh, something that's interesting. 91% of African Americans believe in God. 91%. So you should uh, take your racism, if you ever have any, and throw it right out the window. Because we have 91% of African Americans believing in God. doesn't mean they're saved, but uh, I know a lot of African Americans, and while they do get involved in a lot of emotionalism, a lot of them are saved. A lot of them know that Jesus Christ is their Savior. And in fact, percentage-wise, I would go ahead and guess that percentage-wise, there are more African Americans in this country saved than white people. And this poll uh, suggests the same thing, because 91% of African Americans believe in God. 81% of Hispanics believe in God. And 78% of whites believe in God. So, uh, racism, there's really no point uh, for it, especially for white. We're in the uh, 78% category while they're in the 91% category. 87% of Republicans believe in God compared with uh, 78% of Democrats. And then 75% of Independents believe in God. 82% of those with no college education believe in God while 73% of those with a college education believes in God. So, so much for a college education. Doesn't mean anything compared to eternity. But, of course, uh, I want to preface this by saying that if you believe in God, doesn't mean you're saved. Lots of Jews believe in God. Lots of people believe in God, but it has to do with faith alone and Christ alone and that brings salvation. And I thought that was interesting, and I thought I would bring that uh, to you today since we're dealing with the fact that Jesus Christ has been uh, trying to give the gospel to a bunch of religious people, and they've said, no, no, no. And uh, they've ridiculed him for giving the gospel. And uh, in fact, in uh, turning your Bibles to Matthew chapter 15, verse 12, we went over this briefly, and we'll go over it again, and then we'll move on. Now, in 1512, uh, we have the fact that our Lord, uh, previous to this, had really chewed out the religious crowd. He really insulted them, offended them, and but they were trying to insult and offend him first, remember? Uh, they came up and said, why don't your disciples wash their hands? Really made a big issue out of it. And then our Lord said, well, why don't you follow the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, respect your father and mother, but instead you have found a loophole in which you can uh, reject your father and mother and uh, let them rot to death without your help. And uh, it really stepped on their toes because it was true. And when truth hits, it really uh, burns people's hides. And uh, Matthew tends to do that with anyone, and especially here, because even the disciples get a little disturbed. And remember, the disciples are the students of the Lord Jesus Christ, and right now they're a bit disturbed, and they're wondering what our Lord's doing, and why are you ripping these people apart so much? You'll never win anybody over if you keep uh, harping on them like that. So then the disciples, students, came to him and said, Did you know that the Pharisees were offended by this? So even his own students at this point got mad at him. And after seeing all the miracles, well, they saw them. But uh, to them, it was like, so what? Because they had been buddy-buddy with some of these Pharisees. And they uh, talked to the Pharisees before the message and said, hey, let's go listen to this Jesus Christ. He's a good uh, preacher, and you need to listen to him. He's got a message. And they started out all right. But they were buddy-buddy with them. That's how they got them to go to the church, as it were, or in this case, the synagogue. Uh, but what happened was they got them all there and they were buddy-buddy and then the Lord just ripped them apart. 
just looked right in their eyeballs and said, uh, You're, you are disgusting people, basically. And that's what he told them. And he says, you need to have a Savior. I'm your Savior. And they all rejected it. And so the disciples were a bit upset and embarrassed by all this. So they came up to the Lord and said, Did you know that the Pharisees were offended by this? And we have to know what Pharisee is all about. Pharisees are the people who never get criticized. They're the people who have a title beside their name, and no one has ever criticized a Pharisee up until now. I mean, you don't criticize a Pharisee. These people have studied the Word of God, and they did study the Word of God as unbelievers, and you can do that academically. And they studied all the Old Testament Scriptures, and some of them had memorized all the Old Testament Scriptures. They were experts in the law. Definitely experts. And uh, they deserve that title because they did spend all their lives studying the Mosaic Law. But suddenly they're insulted. It would be like uh, insulting a professor who has uh, taken all his time to study history and then you come along as a student and uh, look at that professor and you tell him how it is and that professor gets upset and takes points off your grade. It happens. And the same thing occurred here. Uh, Jesus Christ, who had no formal education as they had, came along and told them like it was. They didn't like it at all. And uh, the disciples got flack for it. And they uh, were standing around the Pharisees, and they probably came up and said, What are you doing hanging around this man? This man is outside of tradition. He's not following our tradition. Uh, he's not even educated. And you're just following him blindly, etc., etc., and so they uh, reported this to Jesus because they got upset about it. They were upset with our Lord as well. So there's some points we can take from 1512, and that is point one. People who will not accept doctrine are offended by doctrine. People who will not accept doctrine are offended by doctrine. And I want you to know that... Uh, this message was made way before anything, and uh, uh, actually these are the points that were made a, uh, quite a while ago, so it doesn't pertain to any of you specifically, it's just part of the ebb and flow of what we're studying. So people who will not accept doctrine are offended by doctrine, and religion rejects doctrine. That's a point also under point one. Religion rejects doctrine. Therefore, religion fights doctrine all the time. What were these Pharisees doing? You see, the Pharisees came up with a question. And why did they phrase it as a question? Because they wanted to trap our Lord. And they wanted to appear as people who were interested in the Word. So if you want to appear as interested in the Word, you come up to the pastor or a Jesus Christ or whoever is giving the sermon and you ask a question. And so the person giving the sermon will automatically think, well, this person must be interested in what I have to say. They have questions. But it's not always true. The only reason they had a question was to impugn our Lord, to uh, despise Him, to trip Him up in some way. But they couldn't do it. Of course not. So legalism, too, rejects doctrine. And legalism is for those who have believed in Christ. They've believed, but now they go toward uh, uh, the legalistic route and they think that their spiritual life has to do with working for it and they must work after salvation and they must be goody two-shoes and as long as they don't follow, uh, as long as they follow certain taboos, they're going to be uh, just fine in, in God's sight. That's how they see it. But the fact is, uh, following a taboo doesn't make you just right in God's sight. It's being filled with God the Holy Spirit. So legalism too fights doctrine. And legalism and religion, they both seek to obscure doctrine. And their questions, the legalistic questions, the religious questions, they were all designed to obscure doctrine. See, our Lord had been going around teaching doctrine, teaching the fact that He's the Savior. And so the religious crowd would get up and ask a question. And they would ask this question only to obscure doctrine. And they would ask it and say, uh, Your disciples don't wash your, their hands before they eat. 
And that's part of the Mishnah. It's part of tradition. You should wash your hands before you eat. And then our Lord comes back and says, Oh, you give me something from Mishnah, which is commandments of men. Something that man has created. And yet you don't even take care of your parents. You disgusting people. You talk to me as if I failed. And yet you don't even take care of your parents. And that's what he said to them. And that offended them. Because it was true. And it was true that they had not taken care of their parents because of uh, uh, the, uh, the fact of the Korban, which we studied earlier. So point two, the disciples have been influenced by religion. They'd been standing around these Pharisees, uh, some of whom obviously they became a bit chummy with, and they started to hear the criticism as soon as our Lord started to rip them apart. And they were influenced by that. And they said, oh, our Lord must be getting off track. Our Lord, in perfect perfection, getting off track. And the disciples, in their arrogance, their unmitigated gall, going up to our Lord and saying, uh, hey, Lord, uh, did you know that the Pharisees were offended by this? Is he not Jesus Christ? Of course he knew. That was his whole point. He was either going to, one, offend them, or two, make them come around to faith alone in Christ alone. And they had a choice. The Pharisees did. Our Lord was doing everything right. And He made it clear. You believe in Me, or you reject Me. And they decided to reject Him. And then the disciples, after their rejection, heard all of this blather from the religious crowd, and they followed along with it and were influenced by it. And so they uh, came up to our Lord and had a complaint. They shrouded their complaint, though. They weren't going to go straight up to the Lord and say, you're wrong on this. They wouldn't do that. Uh, he, is, he is the Lord Jesus Christ, and they knew at least that much. But they said, did you know that the Pharisees were offended by this? And, uh, well, here's your sign. No, uh, uh, Jesus Christ would you? Uh, no, I didn't know that. Of course he knew it. Here's your sign, stupid disciples. Of course he knew. He intended it to be so. So point three, the Pharisees were bad because they knew that the Lord was right. They weren't mad because uh, of the... Do they weren't mad. They were mad because of the doctrine, actually, because the doctrine was right. But uh, they weren't mad, really, at the personality of our Lord. Our Lord was perfect. And his personality was as compassionate, more compassionate than anyone on the face of the earth. I mean, how could anyone die on the cross as a substitute for us without having compassion? This man, our Lord Jesus Christ, was compassionate. Yet the Pharisees couldn't see this and they weren't impressed with doctrine. And so they criticized the Lord. And so they were impressed with criticism. The disciples were. His own students became impressed with the criticism of the uh, Pharisees. Now in point four, uh, this is a point we have to take because we can't get enough doctrine. I mean, even if we could have the opportunity and the chance to where our bodies would let us stay up 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and the only thing we did was hear doctrine 24 hours, seven days a week, we still wouldn't get enough. And this is the point that our Lord is actually making here. And um, the fact is, uh, one hour a day is nothing. But culture says otherwise, and we see that from this uh, this thing I read to you earlier that talked about how 26% of the people uh, can only make it to church once a Sunday, and they think they're doing something good by doing that. And the fact is, when you get down to the brass tacks of it, most people uh, don't care for doctrine. That's the brass tacks of it. It's always been that way. It's that way today. And people go to church uh, once a Sunday in order to um, nod to God, in order to think that they'll get some blessing out of it. But that's not the purpose. The purpose is a daily perception, metabolization, and application of doctrine. It's something that has not readily happened in human history. And it did happen during the time of the Apostle Paul. And that's where we get Ephesus, the great pivot of the Roman Empire. What allowed the Roman Empire to last until 4, 
uh, 96 AD. Nothing but a pivot. Nothing but uh, people who were interested in listening to the Word of God day by day. And when the Apostle Paul was around, he was able to draw large crowds from all over the Roman Empire. Large crowds. And they would come and listen to him every single day. And not just for one hour. I mean, the Apostle Paul would get on a kick, maybe go for six hours, maybe go all day long to where they would have to miss lunch. And that's where we get the concept of fasting. Fasting has to do with missing lunch and missing dinner because you're too busy listening to the Word of God. We don't have that today because, uh, well, we're just not that as interested as they were during the time of the Apostle Paul even. And notice it was the Romans, the Romans, the Gentiles who would come and listen to Paul. And they would listen to him all day long and not tire of it and listen to doctrine and listen to doctrine. But even after they heard that much doctrine in such a short amount of time, the Apostle Paul would leave and go to another area. And then the Judaizers would follow and say, yeah, the Apostle Paul, he's right in this area that you must believe in Christ, but you must also be circumcised. And they would go on and say that and then take them right away from doctrine. They'd fall for it just like that, even though they had heard so much of it. And we too are capable of being led astray, and that's the principle. So the point from number four is you can't get enough doctrine. And I've had people from Baraka Church of all places come up to me. I don't know how they knew me. Maybe they heard me through the grapevine. But uh, some young fella came up to me. Uh, yes, doctrine is great, and you, but you can get too absorbed in doctrine, he told me. You can get uh, too much in, involved in it. And uh, uh, you'll be weird if you do that. And the fact is, uh, no, that's wrong. If you don't like doctrine, you're the weird one, but the fact is, it's culture. Nobody really cares for it, so culture says you're weird for really caring for it that much. But the fact is, you can't get enough. The wineskins that are given to us are new wineskins, and they are able to be filled with all the doctrine in the world. And you can never get too much, and none of us will ever get too much. Now, sometimes we'll get a lot and we won't understand it all. It just means we need to go back over it. It doesn't mean we... I mean, it's like cramming for a test. If you try to cram for a test and you do it all at once, you'll probably fail the test. But if you do it over time, you see it's not a one-shot decision. If you do it day after day after day, the test will come easily. But uh, there is a point where if you, uh, you can all of a sudden try to shove it all in all at once during a couple days' time period, yeah, you're going to fail doing that. It's a daily thing, every day, for the rest of your life. And if you listen to one hour of doctrine every day for the rest of your life, you still haven't got enough. No one ever gets enough. No one. I will never get enough. My pastor never got enough. My pastor's pastor never got enough. And there's a story about my pastor's pastor. is Milo F. Jamison. He's from California. And he was studying uh, uh, as a pastor teacher in California. And uh, my pastor came across him, and he was a good Bible uh, teacher. There are no tapes of him. He's before uh, tapes and all that was invented. Uh, but uh, my pastor would go to him, and he would teach quite often. I don't think it was every day, but quite often, as much as he could. And uh, one night... He was studying in his study, and his secretary came in and said, uh, you know, uh, Pastor uh, 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 Milison, or whatever his last name was, you know it's uh, getting, uh, uh, getting kind of late, uh, maybe you should turn in and go to bed. And he turned around, and he looked at her, and he said, it's better to burn out than to rust out. That was the last words he ever said to any person on the face of the earth, from that moment on, because the next morning, and that same secretary went in to check up on him, and his face was laying down in the Bible. He was dead. He was face to face with the Lord. But he went to be face to face with the Lord, uh, burning himself out on doctrine. That's the best way to go. That's the way my pastor always wanted to go, but the Lord had different plans. But that's the way his pastor went, studying the Word just uh, digging into it, and uh, late at night studying it while everybody else is sleeping. He's looking over these things and then drops dead. Well, 
He burned out. He didn't rust out. And he surely has his rewards in heaven. So we can't get enough doctrine. And all the Pharisees are all upset because uh, our Lord's teaching doctrine something they've never heard before. Now, now we'll move on to 15, 13. 15, Matthew 15, 13. And he replied, every plant that my father, my heavenly father did not plant, that's the unbeliever, will be uprooted. 14, 15. Stay away from them. That is, stay away from those who are critical of you because you attend Bible class. Stay away from them. They are sucking you astray. And uh, even though our Lord was with the disciples, His students all the time, they were still being led astray. And so He had to step up and say, Stay away from them. They're no good. They are blind guides. In other words, disciples, they're leading you astray. And then He goes on to give them example. If one blind person leads another blind person, both will fall into a ditch. In other words, disciples, if you follow these Pharisees and their legalism and their religion, you're going to fall in a ditch. Now notice it doesn't say they'll be uprooted. Uh, 15.13 talks about being uprooted. Well, they're saved. They'll just fall into a ditch. And our Lord will get them out, whether it be through the sin unto death or however they go. If you die the sin face to face unto death, that's God's gracious way of getting you out of a ditch. Because when you die the sin face to face with death, you've made so many choices in life contrary to the Word of God that you're about to die the sin face to face with death. But, but even in that, there's grace. And God lifts you up out of the ditch and takes you straight to heaven. And there you are face to face with Him in a state of complete happiness. And uh, even though you'll miss out on some reward, you'll be definitely glad to be there. And so uh, being a loser as a believer doesn't mean you lose your salvation. It just means that you lose out on your uh, rewards for eternity. And now we have uh, 15, uh, 15. We've just had our Lord uh, talk directly to the disciples. He's talked directly to Peter. He probably looked Peter straight in the eyeballs because uh, Peter had a personality that was quite outgoing. Uh, Peter was a very outgoing type person, and he probably was the one who went up and said, uh, Lord, do you know they were offended? And now he's about to say something else. He's always rattling his mouth, and it gets him in a lot of trouble sometimes, but he'll straighten out later on in his spiritual life. So in 1515, but Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Now Peter's allowed now. And what he has to say isn't so bad. It's just indicating that he's so, he's so embarrassed by our Lord. Uh, you see, he chewed out the Pharisees. Now he's chewing out the disciples. And Peter's so embarrassed about it, he's trying to change the subject. He's kind of nervous now. And uh, Peter, being the loud mouth, uh, chimes in and says, uh, uh, Hey, explain this to us. In other words, uh, in other words, Lord, uh, st stop being so down on us. Explain to us what you mean. And our Lord was definitely eager to do that. And then our Lord, uh, but he doesn't let him off the hook exactly, because we see what he says in fifteen sixteen. Jesus said, "Even after all this, you still don't have understanding." After all this refers to the time when Jesus was out there on the Sea of Galilee and a storm came up and he was asleep and he calmed the sea and yet Peter still didn't have enough faith to trust in the Lord. Still didn't have enough faith to trust in his ministry to the uh, Pharisees. He's saying, oh, you're all out of line. And then our Lord says, uh, you still don't understand after all this? After you saw me calm the seas, he doesn't say this specifically, but after all this indicates that uh, Peter should have remembered these things. He should have remembered the feeding of the 5,000. He should have remembered all the miracles. Peter and the disciples have seen much more than we will ever see in terms of miracles. They saw the healing of person after person. Thousands of people were healed before the very eyes of Peter. He saw storms calmed by the very work of Jesus Christ. And not just one, but we've had two. And Peter himself has walked on water. Imagine yourself walking on water. 
And now, after you walk on water that the Lord allowed you to walk on, you're going to criticize the Lord. Well, it just shows what knuckleheads the disciples were. And they were knuckleheads. And the fact that the reason why, the, the most basic reason is the fact they did not have the filling of God the Holy Spirit, which brings an extra power to our spiritual life. And I dare say that uh, there's probably no one in Scripture outside of these 11 disciples being such hard-headed people. And they were hard-headed for a reason, to teach us something. And it should be encouragement to us because Peter went on to go through evidence testing. And if Peter can do it, we can do it. And that's most definite because Peter had seen all these miracles, yet it had no impact on him. And the reason why is because miracles aren't designed for spiritual impact. Doctrine is designed for spiritual impact. Doctrine is. And that is what Peter did not have, and that's what the disciples did not have. They had seen all the miracles in the world, but what they needed was doctrine. So if you're seeking miracles, of course they do happen from the omniscience of God. But the fact is, if you have doctrine, you have far above and beyond miracles. Far above and beyond what you could ever ask or think. So Peter, in this question, is trying to answer the Lord. He's put on the spot, really. Uh, our Lord put all the twelve disciples on the spot, minus Judas Iscariot, who was an unbeliever. And he's uncomfortable by that. So he feels like as he's kind of the leader of the group by now. And the, and he's made himself leader of the group anyway. And so he says, as a loud mouth, uh, explain the parable to us. And then the Lord says, even after all this, you still don't have understanding? Well, there's an insult right there to Peter. And then in 1517, what does our Lord do again? He repeats what he just said at the end of 1516. Do you not understand? Uh, you can understand that our Lord didn't have us in nature, so he wasn't frustrated or irritated, but he's trying to make a point. And so he repeats it. You still don't have understanding? Then in 1517, do you not understand? Then he goes on to give the explanation. Our Lord ain't going to chew him out without an explanation for it. So he says, do you not understand that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and then passes out? into the toilet, that is actually the meaning of uh, this verse. Do you not understand that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and then passes out into the toilet? And he's trying to describe to them uh, what he's doing. He's bringing their focus back on the, uh, the Pharisees' argument. The Pharisees' argument was, how can you be so great when your disciples don't wash their hands? And our Lord brings it right back and says, Don't you understand that whatever you put in your mouth goes into your stomach and comes out into a toilet? And I could be crude about it, but I won't be. But that's what our Lord's saying. This stuff is insignificant. Then he goes on to say in 1518, But the things that come out of the mouth come from the frontal lobe, the stream of consciousness, and these things defile a person. That is what you think defiles you. If you think in terms of gossip, maligning, and judging, if you think in terms of mental attitude sins, that defiles you because it will come out of your mouth eventually. 1519, for out of the frontal lobe, the stream of consciousness, comes evil thought. Notice there's thought there, and what you think is what you are. Evil thought, murders. You can have murderous thoughts. You may never commit murder, uh, overtly, but you can have murderous thoughts, and all of us have, and adulteries, and fornications, thefts, blasphemies, and slander. All of these things originate from thought and eventuate in coming out of the mouth. And then if you go so far as to murder, it's actually overt. Those are the three categories that our Lord covers. Then in 1520, these are the things that defile a person. Not eating with unwashed hands that defiles a person. So he makes it clear. And they're upset because the Pharisees are upset at them and uh, they want an answer about it. So the Lord gives them an answer and says, look, they're upset about nothing. 
They're upset because uh, you eat with unwashed hands. Well, that doesn't defile you. It's eventually going to come out into a toilet. What defiles a person is what these Pharisees are doing. What defiles a person is gossip, maligning, and judging. What defiles a person is all these mental attitude sins. And the Pharisees never thought about mental attitude sins. Their focus was always on the overt, the superficial. The Pharisees were superficial people. And superficial people have a hard time with doctrine, always. Because when you're superficial and you always have your focus on, well, I've noticed uh, some people uh, not around here, not uh, making fun of anyone around here, but I've noticed people when I went to high school make fun of other people and how they dress. That's superficial. Superficiality. And that's ridiculous. No one should ever make fun of anyone else and how they dress. And I was around these people, and I always uh, shunned them. And I always made it clear to tell them, I'm not impressed with your uh, degrading of other people. And they would degrade someone for not being so smart. Maybe they had a mental handicap. They would make fun of them. Well, children are cruel that way. And so are adults who don't have doctrine. They're still acting as children. And it always irritated me to see people make fun of other people. And that's what the person who is superficial does. If you have doctrine, that making fun of people goes out the window. You don't make fun of people anymore. And you don't call people redneck and you don't call people the N-word. And you get away from all that. And that comes from Bible doctrine. But they didn't have it, so they were used to all this superficial attitude. Now we move on to 1521, and this deals with the faith of the Canaanite woman. And this woman is a Syrophoenician woman. Syrophoenician, that's spelled S Y R O. P-H-E-O-N-I-C-I-A-N. I don't know how many of you are interested in it, but if you're interested in history, then uh, you'll know what a, a Syro-Phoenician woman is. But she was Syro-Phoenician, Canaanite. In other words, not a Jew, a Gentile. This woman is a Gentile, a Gentile woman. Then in 1521, we have something interesting. After going out of that place, Jesus went into the region of Tyre and Sidon. Why? Tyre and Sidon are Gentile regions. And we're going to notice something very interesting about our Lord and how He presents things because He's talking about He walks through Tyre and Sidon. He went through them. He didn't preach there. There's no indication he preached there at all at this point. He just walks through Tyre and Sidon. And his disciples, his students are there with him. And they're all walking through Tyre and Sidon. Why are they doing that? We'll find out why. Now Tyre and Sidon are two cities of Phoenicia. And they have been rebuilt at this point, and they've resumed their sea trade. The Phoenician Empire before this time was great. It was a great sea uh, trade, and they had a lot of uh, uh, navigators and all of that who uh, manned great ships, and they uh, uh, traversed and traded, and they were a very wealthy capitalist country. Phoenicia was capitalist. And they had went under during Rome, but at this time, these two cities came back together, were rebuilt, and now they're resuming their sea trade. Now, one thing we need to know about this I know that you were taught in school that Columbus was the first person to discover America. That's not true. The Phoenicians were here way before Columbus was. All that's documented in history. Why they don't teach it in school now, I don't know. I guess they're stuck to tradition. But it's been found by archaeologists that uh, the Phoenician Empire, long before Columbus, had actually uh, landed in places like Maryland. And at this point, it was the Carthaginians. They were known as the Carthaginians. Also, the Scandinavians, right after them, came to America, way before Columbus. And when you think about it, even before all of that, the Indians were here. Where did the Indians come from? They came across the Isthmus in Alaska. And what does that indicate? Well, there's no Isthmus now. 
an isthmus is a piece of land surrounded by water, a small narrow piece of land. And at one point there was a small narrow piece of land between Russia and Alaska. And that's where the Indians came from. And that's why they looked Oriental. That's why if you look at a Mexican, and they're mixed, of course, European, and they're mixed with the Indian and the Asian type race, they have a tendency to look a bit Oriental if you really study them close enough. And that's because the Orientals came across this small isthmus into America and they uh, set up tribes and such as that. Uh, that were, and these tribes, uh, our culture tends to glorify the Indian. They were degenerate people, unbelieving degenerates, and uh, they were destroyed because God wanted them to be destroyed. And they always, when you go to school, they always try to say that the white man was so bad for doing what he did to the Indian. The Indian deserved everything he got. He was vicious. He had child sacrifice. They were a vicious people. There was nothing kind about them. They were degenerate. And uh, so we had these people come over even long before uh, Columbus was here. Uh, but uh, even then, we had Phoenicians here as well. And they just looked at it. They didn't settle here. They just uh, took a look at it and went on. Because at this point, the Carthaginians were being overrun by the Romans. And so they decided that uh, uh, they needed to get back to their own empire. They needed to come back to Africa to fight for the motherland and uh, stop being over here in uh, what is now America. And so that stopped all of that. But if that had not have happened, um, it's fair to say the Carthaginians would be the first to settle America. So why did Jesus go to Tyre and Sidon at this point? Gentile regions. He didn't preach there, so what was he doing? Well, he knew something that the disciples didn't know. He knew that there would be a Gentile woman who was there who needed help. And he knew there was a Gentile woman there who knew enough who knew enough doctrine to use the faith rest drill. So in 1522, as a result of this, a Canaanite woman, this Canaanite woman is a Gentile. A Canaanite woman from the area came and kept yelling out. She kept on doing it. It wasn't a one-time thing. She kept yelling out over and over again because our Lord at this point was ignoring her. He was ignoring her for a reason. It wasn't out of cruelty. We'll see why. And she kept saying, Have mercy on me, Lord. When she said Lord, that means she recognized the deity of Christ. Therefore, we can assume very naturally that she was already saved because she used the vocative Lord, which recognizes the deity of Christ. Which, by the way, Judas Iscariot never in all of his lifetime ever used the vocative Lord. He always said, Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi. Never said Lord. Yet this Gentile woman, this Canaanite woman who had always been uh, generally the enemy of the Jew as per a race, comes up and looks at Christ and says, Lord! Something that not even Judas Iscariot had ever come to do. And so this indicates her faith alone in Christ alone as per 1 Corinthians 12.3 because 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 3 says this, No one can call Jesus God apart from the ministry of God the Holy Spirit. And by calling Him Lord, she was calling Him God, recognizing His deity. So she was saved. And this indicates she was saved. In fact... This woman actually recognizes Jesus Christ in hypostatic union. She understands the hypostatic union. A Gentile woman. Now the disciples, uh, the reason why our Lord let this continue is because the disciples needed to be taught a lesson. And, but the, they didn't learn anything from it because apparently this Gentile woman knew a lot more doctrine than even the disciples who had been with our Lord uh, going on a year or two by now. And throughout the whole thing, they'll be with our Lord three years, and then finally, finally after his death, they'll catch on. But this woman has more faith than they do. That's why our Lord lets her continue. That's why he's just dragging her along. And he's, he's trying to look at the reaction of the disciples. You know, our Lord could have uh, answered her request in a second. He knew he could. But he's dragging them along, and he's saying, I want to see how the disciples are going to react to all this. How have they been growing up? 
What they should have done is looked at this uh, woman, this Canaanite woman, this Gentile, whom they despised. There was a lot of racial tension back then. And we don't have it as much today, but there's still racial tension between blacks and whites, etc. And uh, it would be as if uh, the, the race that you think lowly upon is following you and screaming out to you for help. And the disciples just have no clue what to do with this. But uh, what's interesting is she understands the hypostatic union. We know this because she says, Have mercy on me, Lord, that's deity. Son of David, that's humanity. And she recognized our Lord as the, the king of the Jews. A Gentile recognizing the Lord as the king of the Jews in his humanity and as God in his deity. Phenomenal. She knew more doctrine than the disciples did. Absolutely a phenomenal woman, a Gentile woman. But our Lord just strings her along, not in order to teach her a lesson, although he will uh, actually uh, test her in some way in a moment, but uh, the lesson will be for both of them. She'll pass the test. His disciples are going to fail miserably. It's really a sad commentary on these nitwits. But... They will come around, and that should be encouragement because all of us are nitwits in our life and all of us must come around to doctrine if we want to grow in grace and in knowledge. So in 1523, and by the way, I left this part out where it says a, a Canaanite, a Gentile woman from that area came out and kept yelling out. This is in the imperative mood. She wasn't just yelling. She was demanding. She was demanding our Lord. She was saying, Lord, help me. Now, she had a privilege to do that because she was a believer. We, too, have the privilege to do those things. And we get that from the faith rest drill, which was something she was using. She was using the faith rest drill. She recognized him as Lord and as son of David. And she also was using the faith rest drill, something the disciples never used. Peter all used it for a little bit, for a, a couple minutes when he jumped off the boat and walked on the water. And then he got distracted and fell in the water. But this woman was using it constantly. And this was something that should have shocked the disciples, but it didn't because of their self-righteousness and th them thinking they were racially superior. Then in 1523, while our Lord is being demanded of this by this woman, but he did not answer her a word. That's the Lord saying this in 1523. Is that right? Matthew 1523. But he did not answer her a word. Then what happens? This is interesting. His disciples came and kept begging him. Send her away. Kept begging means they kept on asking him to do the same thing. Send her away. Send her away, Lord. Because she keeps on crying after us. What happened? The disciples got irritated. The last, Well, first of all, they got their eyes on the other people watching the whole spect spectacle. Here is Jesus and the disciples walking along. And here's a woman walking up behind them, a Gentile woman. They're, by this time, they're walking back toward Israel. And here's a Gentile woman following them, crying out constantly, asking for help. And they're just walking along and our Lord's not answering. So then the disciples uh, get the idea that our Lord is thinking like they are. The disciples get the idea that our Lord is thinking, hey, this woman's a Gentile. She does not deserve my attention. That's what the disciples start thinking. And so they start to beg the Lord because everybody is watching them. And they're a, a bit scared about what people will think. So they say, Lord, get rid of her. Uh, send her away, do something, uh, but they don't even say heal her. They just say, send her away, because she keeps crying out after us. Now, why is the Lord not answering this woman? It's for a specific reason. He's trying to, the, to teach the disciples a lesson. He wants them to see faith rest in action from not only a woman, and remember in those times they kind of looked down on women, but from a Gentile woman. Now this was something spectacular. And they definitely failed this test. They don't pass it. And in fact, 
uh, there's going to be a series of tests to the disciples because of this, because of their failure. And guess what? They're going to fail the a series of the next test coming up. They're really a bunch of knuckleheads. So the disciples keep on begging our Lord to send her away because they're irritated by this woman. She keeps on calling out. Why does she do it? Because she has faith rest. She knows the Lord is going to eventually uh, uh, tend to her problem. She's a believer and she deserves it. And, and that's a funny way to put it, but she does. As a believer, all of us can go to the Lord with our problems and we can all use problem-solving devices. And she was the faith rest drill. Now they noticed the Lord wasn't going to help her. And, and because of this, they became irritated. They became embarrassed. And they thought to themselves that uh, this woman is lowly. She is not as great as we are because of her race, because of her background. Therefore, Lord, let's just get rid of her. I'm tired of listening to her yap all day long. So you can see here the disciples' complete self-absorption. They don't have any compassion. This woman has a problem and she's been begging the Lord and the disciples are failing this test because they show absolutely no compassion for a woman. And they're not showing compassion toward her because she's a Gentile woman. They're very self-righteous. They're very racist. They think of themselves as Jews. They think of themselves as being the only arbiters of those of grace. And so they fail in every way. So they ask the Lord to get rid of her. And our Lord answers her. And you say, why is our Lord answering her in this way? Well, we'll find out. In 1524, so he answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yeah, she had been yipping at our Lord and now the disciples are yipping at him. And so he finally comes with an answer. So he answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, by this point, you can see all the disciples shaking their heads, yes. Yes, you are for the Jews only. You are for me only. Uh, and you can see them in their self-righteousness. But he says this for a reason. He's giving Israel a chance right now. And, of course, our Lord has come to save everyone, the Jew first, then the Gentile, as it mentions in Romans. Now, it doesn't mean the Jew is first for any other reason than the fact that our Lord was sending a grace provision to them. And it was grace that he was going to the house of Israel first. And at this point, this was God's will for him. He's not saying anything just to be sarcastic. He's just saying, at this point, it is God the Father's will for me to go to the house of Israel only. So, at this point, he switches from testing the disciples to testing the woman. Because the woman is in a helpless situation, and she's looking to the Lord for help, and then the Lord uh, deals her a blow and says, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He knew what he was saying, and he knew that he would eventually heal her, but he's actually putting her in a more helpless situation not that he, he knew she would pass the test. He was doing this to demonstrate something to the disciples. To demonstrate even though things got even more helpless for this woman, she's going to have more faith than any of these disciples, his own students, ever had. And it's going to be a condemnation of them, not of her. So the, do the disciples have a relaxed mental attitude? Absolutely not. They're irritated with this woman. And this, and what our Lord says is, you do not qualify because, uh, first of all, you're not lost. You're saved, lady. You've believed in me. And I've come to the lost uh, sheep of the house of Israel. You're not a lost sheep. You're saved, and you're not of the house of Israel. So there's two points against her. She's not qualified to be healed, in other words. And then in 1525, but she came and bowed down before him and said, Lord, help me. She wasn't going to give up. She knew that the Lord Jesus Christ was the answer, and he just gave her a point of doctrine, which is true. Our Lord came at that point as only being sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That was his purpose. And he gives her a point of doctrine. And she understands this point of doctrine. 
She understands it full well. In fact, she understands it better than the disciples do. She is far ahead of the disciples. And she knows that Christ is her Savior. And she knows that she has a right to go to Christ uh, because she has a problem. So what does she do? She brushes aside what he has just said. Brushes aside what the Lord has said. Because she is looking at the overall ruling of grace. And she knows she's an individual. And she knows she is an individual over under the concept of grace. And she knows that God deals with individuals. And so our Lord comes up with a doctrinal point, which she understands. But she also knows that there is an overruling precedence called grace. And even though... As a point of doctrine, our Lord was sent to the Jews at this point. She knows there's an overruling will called grace, and that's the will of God. For example, and just to bring it to uh, modern terms, God tells you not to have sex outside of marriage, but uh, then, as most people do, you do so. You have sex outside of marriage. You've just violated a doctrinal principle, have you not? Yes, you have. Now, does that mean that you have... Uh, does that mean that you've completely ruined your life and you'll never have a successful marriage? Well, this is what doctrine says, yes, you have. Doctrine says, yes, you've just had sex outside of marriage. I told you not to. You're ruined! That's what doctrine actually says. But grace comes along as a precedence and says, name your sins to God, you'll be forgiven, and you'll be given another chance. So grace, precedes doctrine. That's why it says, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why does it say that? Grace precedes knowledge. Now, you have to have a knowledge of grace, of course. But if you go the route of doctrine only without developing grace orientation, uh, you're going to be miserable because you're going to want to shove everything down everybody's throat. And somebody's going to commit a sin and you're going to be shocked by it and you're going to tell them how they're going to be a failure for the rest of their lives because they've sinned. Well, so what? There's grace too which follows as a precedence. Name your sins to God, you'll be forgiven. This woman understood grace. The disciples did not. The disciples were very self-righteous. And they said to themselves, this woman will, uh, she doesn't deserve our Lord's healing because she's a Gentile. And we're Jews and we're better than her. They were very self-righteous. And our Lord was testing them and our Lord is testing her. And she passes the test, which is what the disciples should have noticed. But they fail it completely. So in 1526, he said, is it not right? It is not right, in other words, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, who are dogs? Gentiles were always referred to as dogs. And in fact, what our Lord is doing is referring to this woman as a dog, not intentionally, not purposely to hurt her feelings or anything like that. He's doing this for the sake of the disciples. Because the disciples were looking at her as a dog. The disciples had a great deal of racial superiority complex on their side. And they were saying, this woman's a Gentile, I'm a Jew. Our Lord shouldn't mess with her. He's only, go- he's only going to mess with Israel as he has said. But you'll see our Lord's about to switch in order to teach a lesson to the disciples. All of this was really designed for the disciples. The woman had enough faith rest. She knew that the Lord was going to help her with her problem. And the Gentiles were first called dogs in Psalm chapter 22. And believe me, it's not a complimentary title. We have dogs as our best friend. But back then, it was not a complimentary title. Now, in 1527, she said, Truth, Lord! In other words, Your doctrine is correct, Lord! But even, now she's going to give a point of doctrine to our Lord. Not that he didn't know the point of doctrine. He most definitely did. He arranged it so that she would be giving doctrine. The disciples didn't even know. A Gentile woman knowing doctrine, the disciples didn't know. They should have been ashamed of themselves, but they weren't. They still felt kind of high and mighty and self-righteous. 
They'll get out of it over time. And our Lord was trying to be shocking, but they were such knuckleheads, they still didn't get the message. So the woman says, Truth, Lord, that's correct doctrine. But uh, she's about to give a superseding doctrine. But even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. In other words, she looks at her problem as a crumb. She is a dog. And not only does she call herself a dog, she calls herself a little dog. She's humble in her own eyes. And then uh, she talks about crumbs. She sees her problem of uh, her daughter, as we will see, being demon-possessed as a crumb. It's just a crumb in her life, a small problem. Now, if we had a child that was demon-possessed, that would probably be the biggest problem we've ever faced ever in history. And we would definitely, and we'd be wondering if they'll live through it or what's going to happen to them. And we'd be all tore up in knots. But th- what, th- what does this woman call her problem? A crumb. That's something we need to understand because when we use the faith rest drill, our problems become like crumbs, minuscule. They don't even bother us. We don't get tore up. Our stomach doesn't get tied up in knots. We just have faith in the Lord that He's going to provide. And she is saying something. She's not teaching the Lord, but she's teaching the disciples. A woman, a Gentile woman teaching the disciples. That's the way our Lord designed it, but they won't get anything out of it. And what she says is, look, I understand this point of doctrine, Lord, that you came to Israel. I know that you are the king of Israel, and that is a correct doctrine. But guess what? Even even us Gentiles, even us little dogs, eat from the crumbs from your grace. And our Lord says this to her. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, your faith is great. Let what you want be done for you. Let what you want to be done for you be done. And the daughter was healed right then. So what we see here is a compliment from our Lord. He had been testing her along with the disciples. She passed the test. And once she passed the test with that phrase that even the dogs eat the crumbs, our Lord compliments her for passing the test. And he says, Woman, Your faith is great. And notice he points her out as a woman. All the disciples thought of themselves highly because they were men. And not just men, they were Jewish men. Big deal is what our Lord is saying. Because he says, woman, your faith is great. Now how many times have the disciples been told that their faith has been great? Ever since our Lord's been with them? Not once. What did our Lord tell the disciples? O oh, you of a little faith. How many times did he say it? Over and over again. It's recorded over and over again. But we don't even have how many times our Lord looked at them and insulted them and said, O oh, you of a little faith. And that's all he'd ever told them. And every time they would come across a problem, he'd look at them, look straight in their eyeballs and say, O oh, you of a little faith. But then this woman comes along, she does one thing. And she shows she has an understanding of grace and the faith rest real. And what does he say to this woman? Woman, your faith is great! The disciples should have uh, woke up by then, but they didn't. They should have thought to themselves, our Lord's never complimented me. In fact, if anything, they should have been a little insulted, but they weren't. They were too knuckleheads to even be insulted. And uh, so he goes, woman, your faith is great. But he had never told the disciples their faith was great. So they should have scratched their head and said, what am I doing wrong? But instead they went on in their self-righteousness. Now by the grace of God, they straighten out later. And that's an encouragement to us. But these disciples, from everything we've been studying, are real stupid Especially especially when you have a woman, a Gentile woman, outdoing them in every way. And there's no indication this woman had been following the Lord all through the deserts like the disciples had. There's no indication she had been all around listening to Him all the time. But whatever contact she had with the Lord, and it's not mentioned, she learned a lot from Him very quickly. While the disciples didn't learn a thing. So she received the compliment the disciples never received. Woman, your faith is great. 
We, we too should uh, desire that compliment. And the only way that we'll receive compliments is if we grow in grace and in knowledge and execute this unique spiritual life. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word. May we come to understand the importance of the faith rest drill. May we come to understand the importance of grace in our lives. And may we grow in grace and in knowledge so that we can glorify you, so that when we enter through those pearly gates, we can hear that most beautiful phrase, Well done, my great and faithful servant. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.